Hey y'all, welcome to Let's Talk. Here's where I step out of my normal video format and look into games that are important to me and where I hope they'll become important to you as well. Think of these as simplified reviews. I hope you enjoy. The term lifestyle game has been thrown around lately. These are games where players structure their lives around. Scheduling playtimes, buy an ungodly amount of merch, attend cons, uh, make videos about. These are all correct definitions of the term, but I would like to add a qualifier myself. A lifestyle game brings comfort and community all tied in a neat package. A lifestyle game feels like home. A lifestyle game is the first game that pops into your head when you hear the term lifestyle game. I'm proud to say Final Fantasy XIV is my lifestyle game. And before I continue, let me change a bit. Let me, mm -hmm. There. Woo! I'm hot now! Other than being a talking head with somewhat competent production value, why should you continue to listen to me in regards to MMORPGs in general? Well, I've sunk a lot of time in games like... World of Warcraft, Ragnarok, World of And just a handful of games I've played since college. So I should have the bare minimum experience recommended when talking about these games. This video will cover the base game, A Realm Reborn, and its expansions, Heaven Sword, Stormblood, and Shadowbringers. With that out of the way, what makes this review of the game different since I assure you there are much more comprehensive and better reviews out there? Well that's the thing, it's not so much as what makes my experience of this game so different, it's how little I've experienced it. By choice. You see, I've only played Final Fantasy XIV as a paladin. Nothing else. No other job or class, no crafting. Just your regular sword and board with substantially shorter queue times. This was more of a personal choice. While I've probably maxed out my paladin short of improving some endgame gear, I understand I'm probably experiencing about 20 to 30% of the entire game, and that's okay with me. Because if I'm having this much fun with so little of the game, imagine how much you could get if you went out for more. So spoiler warnings aside, I won't go too in-depth about what I will talk about first. In Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn, players start out the adventure of their Warrior of Light by selecting base classes namely Gladiator, Marauder, Pugilist, Lancer, Archer, Thaumaturge, Arcanist, and Conjurer. Later on, these classes become jobs via job quests. Paladin, Warrior, Monk, Dragoon, Ninja, Bard, Black Mage, Summoner, Scholar, and White Mage. Later expansions have added more jobs which the player unlocks at certain max levels. Dark Knight, Astrologian, and Machinist were introduced in Heavensward. Samurai and Red Mage were added in Stormblood. Gunbreaker and Dancer saw the light ha, get it? in Shadowbringers. And there's a Blue Mage limited class but no one seems to talk about it so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Once unlocked via quests, players can actually change their jobs on the fly. This is what sets FF14 apart from other MMOs. All these jobs basically fulfill your three basic roles, tank, healer, and DPS. So if you're bored with one class, just switch to another you've unlocked. There are other players that are better equipped to talk about how each job is better than most. Some even made tier videos if that's your thing. But what I can say is none of that matters. All these jobs were so finely tuned 
that you don't really hear a whole lot of major complaints from the community. But don't take my word for it. Please don't! The overarching message from tier video to tier video is the same. All are useful. As a paladin, I never heard groans from party members wanting a different tank. Replace me with a warrior, dark knight, or gunbreaker, and the party more or less gets the same tank, just with a different flavor. That goes the same for healers and DPS. I'm not too keen on astrologians, but they get the job done. And memes about dragoons being floor tanks really don't matter when you meet a dude that actually kicks ass with a spear. And don't forget, the folks at Square Enix are continuously tweaking classes for the better. So don't expect my opinions on astrologians and dragoons to stay the same. As for what I do know, well, what can I say? Players say that paladins are really simple to play as. And I agree. It deals good damage, has great mitigation, and has interesting utilities. But my personal enjoyment of this class comes from mastery. I love being able to place a well-timed cover for my healer. I never panic when we lose our healer since I could also heal and buy time for the rest of the party. And boy howdy is it satisfying protecting the entire party with a huge pair of wings. Well what I'm trying to say is that you should totally play Paladin and none of the other jobs matter because they all suck big hairy balls. I would've lumped gameplay in with the previous section on classes, but how 14 plays is just too unique and too good to be talked about along with something I know little of. If you decide to play Final Fantasy XIV on a controller whether on PC or PlayStation, it would feel like sponge cake with a layer of butter on your hands. It's so tight and concise and the controls outside of chat is neatly centered around the controller. Movement is smooth and responsive. Combat feels natural despite the MMO tab based structure. Traversal and fighting here feels so good, and I now understand what a woman's orgasm. If you play 14 on a mouse and keyboard setup, it should be just as fun as any game out there. The positive vibes from the controls bleed into dungeons and even mini games. 14 at first would feel slow for new players. You see, combat works on a cooldown system for your skills which you will be using a lot. Your basic auto attack is there, but you will not rely on that. Your skills are on two types of cooldown, one global cooldown and another off global cooldown. Basically, one has a universal timer to be used again, while the other has its own timer. This feels slow at first since you don't have a lot of skills at the start, but as you level your job, you get more skills and you start to develop a set sequence of using your skills which we call a rotation. When you consider the amount of skills you need to use in a short amount of time, and timing those skills to go in time with those other skills that are about to get ready, you'll start to feel like you don't have enough time and the game's pace starts to quicken. Damn I say time a lot! Add in damage zones that you need to dodge out of the way and you do not get a moment's rest. This endorphin dance between movement and combat gets addicting on its own. Luckily, Square doesn't leave you with gameplay alone. Most MMORPGs promise you a massively open world experience, and 14 has that in spades, but let's start small. I've mentioned minigames earlier, and there's really a lot. I've done Monster Toss, Tower Striker, I've rebuilt Doma, gate events, and TRIPLE freaking TRIAD! Yes, that same game from Final Fantasy VIII is back in 14, and it's just as addicting as ever. I've spent hours and hours playing opponent after opponent across the world, getting new cards, losing games. If you ask what I did half the time in my first year in the game, I would have told you it was not spent playing Triple Triad because it would mean admitting I have a problem. And I'm not really ready for that. So why am I leading off with minigames of all things? Because while this huge expanse of content is part of the world, it is still a small part of it. I've traveled through towns both complex and simple. Each of them is a living, breathing world to itself. Ulda, Limsa Luminsa, 
Ridania, Ishgard, Alamigo, Ralgar's Reach, Kugane, and Crystarium are all amazing cities to get lost in. Each has its own distinct charm and any player is bound to find home among any one of them. And the lands surrounding these cities are rich with diverse geographical formations and fauna. There's a word I never thought I'd use after elementary. Monsters are unique for the most part in terms of design, while combat is all samey. But if you manage to get a mount and zip by these lands, you can truly appreciate the care that went into designing these areas. I will throw a caveat when talking about dungeons, however. Actual level design has been different from expansion to expansion. A Realm Reborn was a mixed bag at first. Dungeons were large, sprawling mazes that needed a bit of hand-holding for newer players. Some needed a bit of backtracking. So it was kind of embarrassing for me as a new tank to be led on by my party, but they were cool with it. However, with the dungeons released in subsequent expansions, dungeons became more and more linear. Objective-based exploration was slowly done away with in response to what I assume was player feedback, which honestly is a commendable approach by Yoshi P and his team. However, dungeons outside of A Realm Reborn slowly lost what made them unique. Older dungeons, while large and maze-like, never felt arbitrary and had purpose within each dungeon's lore. I know a lot would disagree with me, but it's just a small caveat of mine on my journey through Eorzea so far. And truly, it's the journey itself that I treasure. I decided to talk about this last since it's what I'm most comfortable with. 14 deals with a lot of themes related to self-discovery, struggle, self-reflection, and even loss. The base 2.0 game and its expansions deal with each of these themes in their own unique way. And while the gameplay itself doesn't change, each feels different somehow. So instead of talking about the base game and its expansions in chronological order, I will do it the other way around. Shadowbringers introduces the player into a new crystal, or essentially a new world, away from the source, the world the player was originally from. This land bathed in light constantly, night and darkness no longer exist. Conventional fiction usually associates light with good and darkness with evil. Shadowbringers flips that and introduces an apocalyptic scenario where the surviving populace are left to fight off these dangerous creatures of light. In Eorzea, the player was given the name the Warrior of Light. In this world, it was its own version of the Warriors of Light that brought about this disaster. And light is now the most dominant element. As this world's Warrior of Dark, it's now up to you to bring balance to this world, introducing night to each land. You really feel like the writing for 14 has truly matured and the team is willing to go explore beyond the world they've created while giving themselves a little room to breathe away from Eorzea. Initially, the player was brought here to bring back the friends you've lost. And here's where you see a lot of growth from the NPCs you got to know throughout your adventures as they were forced to survive. I won't dive too much into Shadowbringer since currently its story is ongoing. Stormblood is basically indulging the community's inner weeb with the introduction of the samurai class and the East Asian aesthetic, but generalizing this expansion in this matter is not doing it justice. Stormblood brings the player to the front lines of Eorzea's war against the Empire, the game's antagonist faction. Up until this point, we haven't gone face to face with the Empire's main forces. And with a substantial force of our own, we sought to liberate the lands of Alamigo and Doma. I would say it was refreshing to step out of your standard European fantasy aesthetic and find some places closer to home. Yo, you gotta love that Ruby C! As you slowly win back lands away from the Empire, you get to meet people struggling with their own interests, their families, and loyalty to their own people. I would have told you that these struggles are pretty cut and dry, but given what has happened so far in 2020, I could understand that struggle. Your leaders have failed you, and you may have lost family. It's so easy 
to doubt yourself. Characters like Kian, Lise, and this bitch certainly know that struggle. It's that struggle that Stormblood brings front and center. Okay, so I'm not the biggest fan of Heavensward. Not because I feel that Dark Knights are diametrically opposed to Paladins, but rather this expansion felt like a downer. As powerful as Ishgard's theme hits you, it feels so oppressive as well. And I think that encapsulates the whole expansion. The three other city-states of Eorzea need help from their fourth member, Ishgard. Unfortunately, Ishgard has problems of its own, namely dragons. Big ones. Due to a complex history between your elven Frenchman and Nidhogg, war has been waged for ages and Ishgard is in no position to fight off the Empire. And for the majority of Heaven's Word, you find yourself balancing between pride and hatred. Ishgardians are proud people, sometimes to their own detriment. So much so that the tall spires of Ishgard looking down at the rebuilding streets below is symbolic of that pride. The pride of the nobility, unwilling to yield to the lower classes, and the pride of the poor, unwilling to forgive the elite. On the other hand, you have unbridled hatred from the expansion's antagonist Nidhogg, which he directs towards the Ishgardians. And because of their pride, Nidhogg's rage brought him to bring about Ishgard's road to destruction. By the end of Heaven's Sword, you will need not to fight only the dragons seeking to burn Ishgard to the ground, but as well some of the elements that have influenced the events of the expansion. So why am I putting A Realm Reborn on last? Honestly, skip everything I said about the expansions and listen to what I have to say about the base game. Hell, just play the base game. I will not spoil it too much. And really, A Realm Reborn isn't the base game. Final Fantasy XIV started out as Final Fantasy XIV 1.0. It was largely a failure at launch due to questionable development choices made by Square, which largely affected how the game ran. At times, it was almost unplayable. It wasn't until the assignment of Naoki Yoshida, or fondly called Yoshi P as its lead, that 1.0 see improvement. However, the damage had already been done, and in what would be a ballsy move, Yoshi P decided to split the team. One team to continue the improvements on 1.0, and another team to create a completely new game, Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn. Once ARR was released, I mean, look at them. The anguish and relief clearly written on their faces. I'll link No Clips documentary on this subject as I cannot do their story any justice. I tell you this because A Realm Reborn's story felt like a celebration of the struggles of the developers, more notably Yoshi P. At the start of the game, the player is introduced into this new world, an unknown in the land of Eorzea. What's even more heartbreaking is that legacy players, or player accounts that experienced 1.0, were largely treated the same way save for a few scenes. At the conclusion of 1.0's story, a group of heroes saved the world. However, at the start of Realm Reborn, or 2.0, people forgot the names of these heroes. While this is also a plot device to insert old and new players, I imagine this was how some developers felt, stepping into a new world different from 1.0. Stepping into a new world different from 1.0 was certainly how Yoshi P felt being brought into the project he was thrown into. As the player is slowly introduced to the world, Fighting the Empire, maintaining some semblance of order in Eorzea, the people around the player started recognizing them for both their ability and compassion, which grew into them recognizing the player as the Warrior of Light. What the game forces the player to do during these instances is to take on quests big and small, and only after completion of these quests would NPCs recognize the player as the Warrior of Light. This naturally endears you to the world and its inhabitants, much like how the developers at Square Enix earned the trust of its community over the years, with steady updates both big and small. 
No spoilers, but A Realm Reborn was a much deserved victory lap for the people that worked on it. And as you saw from the expansions that followed, they did not rest on their laurels. I know I've left out a lot of things talking about this game. I've left out the amazingly hilarious Hildebrand side quests. I'm also not qualified to comment on crafting and gathering and all its related content, but is by all accounts amazing for those that played them. I left out PvP since I've yet to play it. Also housing since I'm poor. Now why make this video on what is essentially a 10 year old game? Why now of all times? This game is important to me. It brought me to the highs and lows of my life. It taught me the value of patience and persistence. I met amazing people across the globe that I would not have met in any other MMO, including two of the most amazing free companies. The MMO gave birth to some of the most wholesome and amazing personalities on this platform. This video was supposed to kick off this channel. Hell, this channel's assets are based on what I wear in-game for the past three years. Let me end with this. 2020 is as hostile as any year has ever been. I was forced to spend time away from the game. And I was away from home. I was away from friends. Couldn't see family. I had no job. And just this month, after a year long absence since I finished the base main story for Shadowbringers, I subbed again and started playing with random players. In this game built on a solid foundation with a compelling storyline and world, inhabited by some of the most patient and understanding player base in MMOs. My paladin, basic look and all, took up his sword and became whole. 2020 didn't matter. I'm back on that journey. I hope you would join me on that journey too. Stay safe. Thanks for watching. Hey there, that was new for me. If you have any suggestions on what I should talk about or anything FF14 related, feel free to comment below and subscribe. Thanks for watching.